And as promised, we are back with our special guest this week, Mr. Robert Schwalb of the Wisconsin Schwalbs, of the New Jersey Schwalbs, of some sort of Schwalbs. And uh, he is here to talk to us today about all things Schwalb Entertainment, including Shadow of the Demon Lord and his new Kickstarter, Shadow of the Weird Wizard. Thank you, Rob, for coming to talk to us. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It is a joy to see you both again. Uh, I have missed you, and my uh, human-sized pillows of you just aren't the same. So thanks for taking some time to hang out with me today. Our, the pillow-sized versions of us are much better than the real thing, I will assure you. You should see the games they run, the stuff they write. It's really top quality. It is. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good stuff. So, Rob, we have you here specifically to talk about your new Kickstarter uh, for Shadow of the Weird Wizard. But we want to go back. Let's go back in time, if you will. Rob Schwab, this is your life. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. No, we, we want to hear a little bit more about you. I think you've actually been on the show before in, in the past times. Uh, but for those who are new to the show... Could you tell us a little bit about you and your game design uh, livelihood, if you will? Uh, sure. Uh, so I, I got started uh, in the in the very early days of the D20 boom. There was a great appetite for uh, anyone who could pick up a keyboard and type out words and had an even passing knowledge of uh, what uh, a D20 system thing might look like. Uh, and because there was a great vacuum into which all sorts of bodies were sucked, uh, I happened to be one of them. And uh, luckily, due to my charming personality and boyish good looks, uh, I was able to secure regular work. Uh, I started off working for a lot of uh, tiny third party companies, and uh, that eventually landed me a gig with uh, Green Running Publishing, doing some freelance work for them. Uh, as well as uh, Fantasy Flight Games with the grim role-playing game from the Horizon series. Um, I think that game is now older than people who can drink, but whatever. Uh, so that, that there's that. And then uh, I, I ended up working with the, the Ronins or the Ronins uh, during uh, from 2003 until, I guess, 08 ish somewhere in there and i was the line developer for the d20 system as well as a line developer for warhammer fantasy roleplay second edition uh and i also while there uh, i designed a song of ice and fire role-playing which is the game of thrones role-playing game uh, i also helped out on witch hunter for paradigm concepts and did a did a lot of freelance for wizards of the coast uh where i got my start on tome of magic uh, and that went on to other great things such as Elder Evils and Exemplars of Evils, Pirates of the Nine Hells. Um, eventually, Wizards of the Coast swooped in, uh, uh, hooked my soul, and dragged me into the Flash Cube of Despair, where I worked on fourth edition products for the entire life of the line. Uh, hilariously, uh, Sean, I was credited on one of your adventures, and I still feel terrible about it to this day. I'm still waiting for my whiskey. Right. I, I've got it. I'm just brewing it. But you you expected it to have my tears. And I cry so much. I keep overflowing the gotcha. whiskey barrel. So from there, uh, I uh, I moved on to work on the 5th edition game. That little thing that people are playing these days, I guess. Uh, and I was part of the design team from the very early days uh, when it was led by Rich Baker. And then I uh, was part of the core design team led by Monty Cook, and then I was still on the design team through its last iterations until I finally uh, left uh, with the books in, well in uh, hands of the powers that were and worked on my own stuff henceforth. And that led with, launched with uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord in 2015, Punk Apocalyptic in 2019, and then now Shadow of the Weird Wizard. Just follow up so, question. Yeah. Did this usher in the pandemic, punk apocalypse? Is all of it responsible? You know, is it all? Uh, back I don't really? think that Kickstarter did well enough to, <laughs> to say that it was directly responsible. I like to think that punk apocalyptic was a game of its time. Yeah. I mean, it was a really, really delicious year, 2019. 
nothing was going on. It was <laughs> smooth sailing. Everything was stable. It seemed like a really good time to write a book about the end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Amen to that. So your your transition then from working on third edition, fourth edition, fifth edition led you to want to make a game of your own, I would guess. Uh sure. Uh I think you know, I've, I've as I mentioned, I've worked on uh, several big box games uh in the past. Um and you know, I I had tried my hand at designing a couple of role playing games from scratch and those were published. Uh and but I've always been kind of a, a yeah, I've always wanted to just make my own thing that would allow me to do whatever the heck I wanted to do in whatever way I wanted to do it without having a committee telling me that we couldn't do it this way or this way. So it was really, uh, I think Shadow of the Demon Lord was very cathartic for me uh, as far as just allowing me to exercise my demons, not exercise them, exorcise them. Uh, exercising my demons is my next game next year. Uh, but exorcising my demons getting rid of them in, and giving them to uh, the world to play with as if they were their own. Um, but now, you know, here we are years later and uh, I'm doing it again. Oops. I did it again. Just like it. And, mm -hmm. You know, when, when you say you know, exercising your demons, I feel like the fifth edition process creating D and D five E left you with a feeling of, I love this part. I don't love this part. If this were my game, this is, I mean, is that kind of what it ended up being? Like, I, I this is what I want the role-playing game or a role-playing game to be? Sure. Uh, I think when anytime you're working with uh, a big property like D&D, &D, and there's really not anything else that's big, but I mean, I guess it was to a lesser extent, uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay had a similar kind of thing. It's a, it's a big, chunky game from a big, huge corporation uh you have a lot of masters you have to you have to appease um and because the design team for fifth edition was something that was rather nebulous i mean there were a lot of casualties along the way um a lot of the attitudes and views uh towards what is essentially D, &D uh differed in some ways that were baffling right i mean we had mm -hmm. some designers who came at this game from with expectations from completely different role-playing games that wanted this to be something that it couldn't be. And then there was the, there, you know, there's always the idea of like, what about the fourth edition fans and how much do we appeal, uh, uh, appeal to them? Uh, are we betraying them as like some of the Pathfinder folks felt betrayed once the fourth edition came out? Um, or do we build a gigantic tent game that allows you to play all different styles of play in whatever way you want, whether you want to play OSR style uh, dungeon delving, uh, where there's not you're not so concerned about what's in your character sheet, but really how you problem solve and work together, or are you looking for more of a tactical play? And we, I think we had the windmill constructed. We knew what we were we were aiming for, but it was just a windmill and not a giant. And so, at the end of the day, we had to make some hard compromises some of which didn't go down so easy for some people uh and by the time i was done it wasn't really clear what fifth edition's future was going to look like uh you know the attitude at the time was like well you know we're writing around pink slips because <laughs> this is like and we shouldn't be calling it D, &D next we should be calling it D, D last because we, we have no idea if this is going to go anywhere and there was a lot of uncertainty um and of course, to my to all of our surprise, it exploded. And I think it was just it was the timing was great, right? I mean, the zeitgeist is the zeitgeist, and uh, I'm not going to send love letters to Stranger Things, but it certainly didn't hurt. And uh, the rise of streaming and the rise of live plays, which were all kind of just bubbling around, they were bubbling, they were simmering at the time of late fourth edition, but I didn't think you know their explosion into fifth and fifth. Kind of embrace bracing of the theater of their mind my, games mindset uh, mind mindset uh, worked out really well and worked out in that game's favor. But to answer your question, since I'm just vomiting forth all sorts of opinions about something I don't work on anymore, um, uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord was not my take of D and D. It was mm -hmm. more about what kind of role playing game do I want to run? And you know, I, granted, there are things in D and D that I really like, but there are also things in D and D that that 
that, that I don't quite so like. And I was trying to create an experience that was both familiar to, to veterans and newcomers, but also give me the space to do my own thing. Yeah. Uh, and so there was, there wasn't, you know, I, I knew that if I said sphincter in an art order, I wouldn't get, or in a creature's description, no one would be slapping my hand because this could be as edgy as I want it to be. And I really like in Shadow the Demon Lord of what Army of Darkness, a role-playing game could look like. Um, uh, and so that was kind of, and that was, a, that was a freeing opportunity for me. I got to see some of the ideas that I was experimenting with uh, in previous designs kind of come forward into its own unique uh, entity. Yeah. And, and if I can so maybe tie the with, two together, sorry, Sean. <laughs> I no. feel like one of the things that has been a surprising part of 5e's success is that there is a sort of a, a simple elegance, not to all of it, but to a lot of it that has resonated with people. And when I hear designers talk about Shadow of the Demon Lord, which is often, I mean, it's all the time. Every designer I know that I kind of care about mentions Shadow of the Demon Lord because it has, I think, an elegance to it, a a, a, a level of unobtrusive gameplay that facilitates more happening that uh, that is really quite, um, I want to say novel, but but it, it does it really well. It's really well executed, maybe as I should say. Um, thank you. Well, thank you, because it is inspiring and, and it's, it's it really is amazing. And I hope you you know how often people are talking about your game and saying like, like Shadow of the Demon Lord, the way it does that, right? You know, the way the turns work, where the way, um, uh, you know, the, the Banes and Boons work, and any of that. And, and we talked about it, uh, I think it was February, episode 127, we talked about uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord, looking back at, at, at systems. And it really is remarkable. And, and, and so I'm curious kind of what inspired the core of the game. Like, how did you architect that core, which I suspect we'll see some measure of in, 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 in Weird Wizard? Sure. Uh, the core thing, the, the, I guess what I was really looking for was I, let me back that up. I hate preparation. <laughs> number one, I don't like to spend any time thinking about stuff when I've got enough to think about on my own. Uh, one of the things, if you love gaming, uh, one of the best ways to kill your hobby is to do it professionally because, you know, it's you have to, well, I guess I could spend eight hours working on my campaign or I could make, uh, I could get a bag of cat food uh, by working on it and selling it and you know sure sometimes those things might might match but the electric bill is more important than um, you know entertaining a bunch of drunk old guys <laughs> in my basement every two weeks so uh, you know that's so preparation is one of them there's also uh, as I have kind of grappled with my own mental health issues uh, there is one thing I cannot stand and that is a sense of being unprepared just go walking into any game sessions like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to actually resolve this. I don't know what's going to happen next because I didn't spend the right amount of time researching this adventure, which has a reference to a novel that came out in 1987. And there's one paragraph in there that invalidates everything I thought was true. And so I have to sync these things. And now I'm, what am I supposed to do? I don't want that. And so uh, what I did with Demon Lord was I designed it toward a no BS approach to the game. Step one. Step two was there's a, there is a, a school of thought that tabletop role-playing games always have the game system working on in the background. It's like a computer that's running in the background. And that it's the objective is to make that computer, that system, that, that operating system as unobtrusive as possible, even though it's always running. I have a completely different way of looking at it. There is no game system. There are, there are solutions to narrative problems. And the rules give you story, give you ways for the story to solve itself. So, for example, we don't have in Demon Lord a mechanism that says, we're talking with the bad guys, we're looking around, God, it happens. And so there's no moment of like, all right, everyone, we're going to pull the big lever and we have to go through some arcane process of sorting our tunes into, into a different order uh, that enables us to go, do you ever get a turn in between monsters? And that initiative count can change. And it's not like I'm picking on D&D. &D. It's like, there's not like shortage of games. 
that have the same kind of initiative system. And so I was like, screw that. Just players go first. And so, you know, they're the ones initiating the action in the story. So what do you do? So if you are sitting in, in a, if you are walking in a dungeon corridor and Junior pops open the door and there are a bunch of weird phallic centipede monsters squirming around the floor, feasting on the carcass of a bullheaded lion for whatever reason. Uh, and you might, I would say, what do you want to do? And somebody would say, I want to go and close this door because I never want to see that again. And somebody else says, okay, we're going to, and, and you go from there. And the rules then just kind of come to the surface while you're, while you're resolving the scene uh, as you're dealing with attack rolls, and challenge rolls, and casting spells. But then it all fades away once that's over and you switch back into the normal back and forth exchange between players and game masters. Uh, and that's kind of, that's just my attitude towards all of it, right? And uh, so Demon Lord was a, was a way for me to kind of show what I really wanted D&D to be like, uh, but without being d d that makes sense, right? I mean, yeah, I think it would be... I think I'm using D&D like I would use Jello. What I want role-playing games to be like yeah. uh, without having to be all those other role-playing games. What other design considerations did you have uh, going into making your own game? Now, you, you said, like, your initiative system is, what do you want to do? You want to do it quickly? You want to do it slowly? Okay, then we go quickly and slowly. Makes perfect sense. What other of, of those considerations did you have? Whether it's game design with that machine you talked about that's supposed to run in the background, or even campaign wide. Uh, right, a so, uh, couple other things I certainly come to mind. Uh, one is uh, I always bristle when I have when I'm running an adventure with a get you a, know, and we're in the middle of the story arc, and we're plotting along, but we can't finish it because it's a 16 hour investment to get through this adventure. And so we play the first session. Everyone has a great time. It's really awesome. And everyone, we know we're, and of course you ended a cliffhanger. And then next time you show up, everybody, but, but Sally can make it. And so either we don't play with Sally, which is feel bad because Sally was the one who pulled the lever uh, or we wait and then we have to try to manage scheduling and then all the thrill and the enthusiasm is gone by the time you can get everybody back together. So rather than think about adventures as big, chunky things that are just, we're all going through the lives of our characters, adventures in Demon Lord and Weird Wizard and in Punk Apocalyptic all zoom in on the most important moments in your character's career. Now, let's say that you're a, a venturing band or whatever, and you know, you're going to have a tavern you go to, and you might have farms or jobs or businesses or love affairs or all the other things that can go that happen in the background that you might you might take time for in some role-playing games to explore. I don't care about that. And neither should you, because your time is precious, and there are only five of you or six of you or seven of you that get together. And if you can get all those people together, do the thing you're there to do, which is tell a cool story and get out. So adventures are all there for one session only. It also means that I'm not into this idea of five, six, 10 year long campaigns. That was charming when I was 15 uh, and doable uh, when I was in my 20s, but it is not doable now. If I can get five adventures strung together in a row, then I'm winning. Mm -hmm. So all the campaigns are 10 sessions long. So that means you can play through a full campaign experience where my character feels like I go from being pretty competent to freaking powerful uh, in the span of 10 sessions because each of those sessions zooms in on a specific period of your character's life. So you might play one adventure and then two years might pass in the in the campaign. And in those two years, your character might have gotten married, had a kid, or didn't have a kid, uh, had a business that failed that business, went on other adventures, did all sorts of other things. But this part here is important to the overarching campaign plot oh, line. And that's kind of that's not a kind of, that is exactly what uh, Weird Wizard and uh, Demon Lord and Punk Apocalypse are all aiming to do. Awesome. I, I feel like we could talk forever about the innovations you have in, in, in Shadow the Demon Lord. Like, I, I love the class system. I love how you split those experiences up to tell a story of a character. Um, so we, we can maybe talk about those, but, but I want to make sure that we really talk about where Weird Wizard is going. And so you, you create Shadow the Demon Lord 
it's awesome. People are loving it. it. It was, I think, a very successful Kickstarter. Hopefully you feel that way. Um, a lot of acclaim being played at conventions and so on. But you're, but you're always thinking, what's the next thing? And so how, how did that come to be? Uh, right. Uh, the thing that I found with Demon Lord is that not everybody likes Evil Dead. <laughs> Who knew, right? I mean, I thought, you want to have toilet humor... Don't you want to, don't you laugh at poop jokes, right? You know, and, and demons exploding out of your, so apparently I was wrong. And so I discovered that as much as people like the game system, uh, there were enough dark things in the game that some folks bounced off of it. And that made me sad, very sad, because I think that there, that the core, the guts of this game were a lot of fun. And you can, even though you can exclude elements and you can, tailored to whatever experience you want uh i know that that immediate that there's there that's a level of effort that i wouldn't go through myself and why should i expect other people to do it so it wasn't long after demon lord came out that i thought i would do a sanitized version and uh, i remember chris premis had said but why isn't that why people buy isn't the toilet humor the reason why people bought demon buy the game anyway but i was like well wait and see and um so I started working on it. Now this is back in 2016, probably, mm. where I started first compiling my notes. And and I know that uh, I've talked about it being like the last five years that I've been throwing my life into this game, um, but it's really longer. Uh, the last five years have been mostly uh, where I've been largely focused on just trying to get it done and get it out the door. Uh, so with this game, I it gave me the opportunity to kind of rethink some of the things that I had done in... Uh, in demon lord for example uh initiative system is a little different it's the same thing where you know you are in a, you're in a story scene but that instead of the players going first uh the monsters go first and the players have the opportunity to say oh, well i want to spend this resource and take the initiative and go ahead of the monsters and they just give up their reaction for the round big deal um but it allows them some agency about doing that and there aren't like two tiers of phases that you're having to go through so it streamlines that Boons and Banes are still there. Path system is still there. Characters are more powerful in Demon Lord because the expectation is this is heroic fantasy, not gritty horror fantasy. Um, so I expect characters to be able to do more and to be able to take more abuse and also be able to uh, do more spectacular things at the top tier of the game, at the master tier. And so the mechanics kind of reflect all that. Um, but some other things that changed too is like, I mean, I kind of, uh, you know, I, I amended my opinion about uh, modifiers for ancestries on your core attributes. That was one of the things that I had kind of wrestled with for a long time. And I, and I finally came down to the idea that like, you know, we just don't need to have, them, right? Because everyone's basically human. We want to treat them all as humans. Then we'll just make them all humans and know, and they all have the same range of potential within themselves. Um, the other things I did with this game too was that. I really looked at how some of the classic classical concepts of monsters that have appeared in fantasy role-playing games are treated and re rethought them to make them more, more appropriate for our modern times. For example, like orcs, there was a big discussion about orcs being inherently racist. Well, in a, and, there, and I could see both sides of this argument, right? I mean, if, if gods create their mortals in their own image, and if you have an evil god, then what you create would be evil. That's kind of the fantastical element there. Uh, but then at the same time, there's also the the trope of the noble savage that I think a lot of people kind of want to embrace or put on the orc, which is also fine. Rather than deal with that at all, I just made orcs monsters that are grown out of sickness of the soul. So that if you are contaminated by the ancient ones, these impossible beings of vast and terrible power that Lord Death himself bound to the chains of the Earth Dragon and wrapped around and made the crust of the world, when they start thrashing around in their dreams, some of their ooze leaks up and that pollutes the, uh, whatever peoples that happen to be nearby and turns them into bloodthirsty killers. So there's our, the orcs are not a playable option at all because they're, they're horrific, not horrific, but they're scary monsters. Mm -hmm. And the way they should be in the concept of like, these are not things that we're going to interact with in a peaceful manner because they are a byproduct of some obvious wickedness that is going on in the campaign setting. So you then created a Kickstarter and yes. it's off and running. And 
we know that you are, are a prolific writer. Um, anyone who knows you or knows the industry is aware of that. And it doesn't look like you're slowing down with this Kickstarter. Uh, we already have via stretch goals, a 350 page core book, a 325 page GM book, multiple quests and more and more and more. Uh, other than questioning your sanity, uh, how, how, how are you feeling about the Kickstarter? Uh, you, you know, I'm, it's exciting. Uh, it, there's the, you know, one of the things that comes with this business is a great uh, sense of imposter syndrome. And even though that I've been doing this for 20 years, I still kind of feel like uh, I'm just full of crap and no one, you know, I'm, mm. this is, so this is the great validation and it does, you know, even, yeah, it is great validation. I will say uh, the, the, volume of content that uh i'm making for this game i think i'd like to remind people that i was going to do this anyway uh then because if you have been following along with demon lord there's no shortage of things to play with in that game uh it is one of the things i, I kind of run into often in tabletop gaming uh is that people have these cool ideas for worlds or games but they never give you anything to do with it uh, and if you do, they're, they're, you know, if you get one campaign a year at most, and then you don't get anything else after that. And you might get a couple of adventures. And if you're lucky, it may be a splat book. And then it's like, then the game's dead. Uh, my games are meant to be played uh, and often. And I will take the hit financially to make sure there are enough quests out there so that people can, or adventures, so that people can play the game for as long as they want. Uh, we've got, as of this weekend, we just unlocked the a big stretch goal, which brought up our total number of quests to 30. That's 30 adventures, uh, plus two full campaigns, which have 10 adventures each of those. That's 50 adventures, plus the top tier Kickstarter backers get three exclusive adventures that will not be published anywhere else. So, I mean, there's going to be a ton of content for this game, not including, and then also, you know, we get new ancestries. We're going to get some new magic. We're going to get some new magic items. We're going to get all sorts of new goodies. And these will, all this stuff will start releasing once the core game's out. And so you'll have a steady supply, a steady stream of weird wizard content that will probably extend two, three, maybe even four years from now. Uh, in addition to what I'm doing for Demon Lord and the last stuff I'm doing for Punk Apocalyptic, as well as the other projects that I've got yeah. waiting to for me to start. It's amazing. So there's a lot. Yeah. I would say to anybody who's listening who has not had the pleasure of backing one of your projects, it is an experience uh, of which there's no comparison in the Kickstarter crowdfunding world. When when you back Rob's projects, you, you're like, cool, I backed it. And then something arrives and you're like, oh, neat, look, I got that. And then a little time passes and more arrives. And that repeats kind of to the end of time. <laughs> like it's It's... It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I'm still every now and then I'll get a punk apocalyptic thing in my mail. I'm like, oh, cool. And, and it's on, and, and like you said, there's a breadth of what's offered that extends the game in a lot of different ways and makes it even more useful because it has so many permutations in, in, in what's available, the types of quests, the types of uh, expansions and supplements that are out there. It, it really is amazing. Um, I, I guess that, you know, I kind of think to myself as a creator, a, how do you do it? How do you write that much? And B, do you think it works to offer it all this way as part of as, as a stretch goal, essentially? A lot of it is stretch goals so that, you know, of course, later you're going to sell it. But, but does that model work or is it just kind of what you have to do the way you, your brain works? Or? Uh, I think in this case, it's mostly I look at a lot of the quests uh, and those kinds of things the smaller bits as advertising costs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I release, uh, I just released the crawling sea on uh, drive through Monday of last week, and it's doing really well. It's still in the top 10 of the under five bucks and people are still buying it. And that makes me very happy. And it's a disturbing, disgusting romp through my, my twisted, twisted imagination. But um, it, you know, for, when you see that product, as a consumer, you're going to see this. Well, that's a dollar eighty nine or two bucks or two twenty nine, and I can buy the game for it for probably discounted, or I can get it through bundle of holding. And then once I and so that's all I that's all I need is just 
just the first taste and mm-hmm. I'll hook you. And that's it. So it's, it's the idea that uh, keeping the game out there, it's much easier to keep sales going on a core book. If people perceive your game as still being alive, mm-hmm. it's much harder to keep your game going because that's where you want your core book sales. And I'm still selling core books every month years later. And it's like this, I'm well into the point when people are just saying it's time for a second edition shout of the demon Lord which is not going to happen because I don't need to make it happen because I can still make cool product for the, the original game. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's worth it. I think it's not a model that everybody can do. Uh, yeah. I don't think I have a superpower. I think it's just, I have a, just the right mixture of self-loathing and OCD to make sure that I can pump out as much content as possible. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Those are those are two wonderful superpowers uh, for a game designer to have, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was just having a conversation, not not quite with those words, but along those lines with my kids about you know <laughs> sometimes why we can produce isn't necessarily all healthy, but you got to run with what you know God gave you or <laughs> what nature gave yep, you. Yep, yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Make most. So, uh, if you had to give one uh, you know the elevator pitch for weird wizard what would that be okay yeah uh there are people in this fantasy world who need your help right now because they're fleeing the collapse of what they have long treated as their civilization and they're fleeing across a salty or salt badlands salt wastelands much like utah they're crossing utah which who wants to do that uh, to get to some place that is far from the chaos, violence, and the the warfare and the disease and all the awfulness that is the old country, and to find something that is new, and this place that's new is called the Borderlands. And the Borderlands, this is a place that has largely been untouched because it had been within the aegis of the Weird Wizard himself. And the Weird Wizard is this sinister figure of vast magical power who dwells in the forbidden city with his clockwork servants and his strange hybrid pig snakes and people tours or whatever and they're all kind of roaming around and no one wants to go there but he vanished so there's this great op- this great opportunity for people to kind of start again and in this borderlands area there are pockets of civilization free cities that dot the coastline of the sea of fear there are uh, the horse lords, which is a vast centaur herd that hunt the curl beaks uh, and and have their own territory and wage war against the hideous Fomorians, which are uh, bizarre amalgamations of humans and beasts cursed by one of the ancient ones. There are twisted fairies that live in the wood, the jungles of Za. Uh, there are secrets to un- uncover, ancient ones to defeat, cults to thwart, demons to, to destroy. There's so much more to do in this game that I can even tell you in this elevator ride and we're getting close to the top floor. So I will tell you this. It's awesome. Yeah. Oh, he's muted again. I have no doubt that it will be awesome and I cannot wait to, to punish and delight my players <laughs> with my first weird wizard campaign. I'm looking very much forward to it. Now, I should mention that this is a family-friendly game. Mm-hmm. There are dark corners, but there are dark corners in every fantasy game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the goal here is to cast as wide of a net as possible to ensure that everybody can come to this game and have a good time. Uh, so there will there are demons. The cosmology has certain elements in common. And if you're a true demon lord nerd, you might recognize some concepts like the void, the gap between realities, and that there might be some shadowy figure that's out there in that void who might mm. cause some problems for this world sometime way, way down the road. But for now, it's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's that's great. Cool. And okay. uh, you guys, you know, you, your heroes are, are heroes. You're going to help these folks establish their new lives here in the borderlands and everything will be sunshine and roses. Until <laughs> well, I, I think you're correct in, in that uh, idea of casting a wider net because as I'm looking at it at this very moment, you're creeping up on three hundred thousand dollars and nearly three thousand backers, with with about halfway through the the Kickstarter. Uh, so I I feel like that maybe outdid Demon Lord 
um, it, just in terms of the raw numbers. Yeah, we did uh, Demon, all of Demon Lord's Kickstarter we did in the first day. Uh, and so we're double that. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think, so, I mean, it's, it's going really, really well. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to jinx it. I'm not a superstitious person, but uh, Kickstarter does contribute to the fear of self-loathing. So it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, I'll be very happy 16 days from now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and for folks listening, it, it ends September 7th at eight o'clock in the morning Pacific time. So uh, do it earlier so that Rob has less fear and loathing. Um, but you can also, I, I don't want to forget this. You can go at, to the Kickstarter page, search, search for Shadow of the Weird Wizard. There's a link in our show notes. And you can get the quick play, which has five pregens, rules, and a complete adventure you can run. So you can even try it out uh, before backing, which is super awesome. And now, Rob, if people want to find your work, not on the Kickstarter, but elsewhere, or follow you on social media, God, God forbid, uh, where can they find you? Uh, right. We are, I have a website. I know it's weird and crazy. There's this new thing called the internet's. Uh, and it's schwabentertainment.com. Uh, I am available and I friend almost everybody except, uh, well, just about anybody on Facebook as Robert J. Schwab. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or also known as X or whatever we'll be called next week as Schwab underscore Ent. Uh, and then I'm also on Instagram, but that's mostly cat pictures, beer, and books. Uh, and then uh, you can, that, then we also have company pages on uh, Facebook. And there's a Shadow of the Demon Lord group on Discord, which also has a lively and uh, um, enthusiastic group of folks who are hardcore Demon Lord, Weird Wizard fans. Nice. Awesome. Pay us nice. anything else? I mean, I just want to thank you, Rob, because everything you design is a pleasure, whether it's for fourth edition, fifth edition, uh, certainly your own games, and, and especially your own games. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited for this. Thanks for creating. I, I know uh, one of the interviews that I read, you know, we were talking about the process of sort of convincing yourself to take this to the finishing line. I'm really glad you did, because I, I think it'll it'll better a lot of designers out there, a lot of DMs as well and players. But but I, I think it's really good for the industry to have this out there. So I'm, I'm excited to see it. Well, thanks, man. I, I would be doing a disservice uh, to the memory of my dear friend, Kim Mohan, without mentioning him. But uh, this would not have been possible without him and his guidance and his mentorship. Uh, and this is uh, the project we were going to do together as kind of our last big go. And unfortunately, we lost it before we could get to the finish line. But uh, this is really for him. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. In incredible. And, and nice. one, of the, one of his many gifts. Yeah. So I'm glad for that. Well, thank you, Rob, and we wish you continued success going forward, and I'm sure we will be reaching out to you again to hear more of your exploits. I can't wait. Thanks, guys, for having me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rob. So there was Rob Schwalb of Schwalb Entertainment, Shadow of the Demon Lord, Punk Apocalypse, and Shadow of the Weird Wizard. I love talking with Rob. It's incredible. And I can tell that this game is different than Shadow of the Demon Lord because I don't feel like I have to go shower right now. I, feel, I still feel clean. I feel refreshed. Right. It's 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 true. It's true. Um, one of the one of the funnest experiences I've had at a convention recently or within the last you know 10 years or so was up in Buffalo. Rob came up as a guest and just, like just sitting at the bar with Rob after the games were done and just talking about experiences that we've had. Uh, you know, he's had much more experience working with wizards and and in the industry than I have. So just like hearing that things I saw were the same things he was seeing. And, and it was, it was a great, it was a great moment for me. Um, I don't even think I ever told Rob that, but uh, it was, it was, it was pretty special. So. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I've had similar experiences uh, with him and a couple of other designers that sometimes you think that, and I've heard this like recently, even on our discord, there've been some comments that sometimes say like, Oh, uh, you know, 2024 process is is off its rocker versus they should have done exactly what they did for 5e. And, and I appreciate that Rob spoke to that a bit in that, like, that was not some perfect 
flawless system. It was cacophony. It was chaos. And through it emerged enough through everybody's hard work and so on that it ended up being this amazing game, uh, which it is an amazing game in its own right. And then also probably a number of other things that made it really explode um, that maybe our luck, but, but a lot of it comes down to that game, but, but it, you, it's not like you look back and you go, Oh yeah, that was a flawlessly executed plan. N- not in the least. Right. And, yeah. and I think you and I probably take guidance from that and looking at 2024 20, that there's some real potential there for it to, to, sort itself out just the way 5e did so <laughs> one hopes yeah yeah but yeah so if you do get a chance please support rob and his work yeah. um and we will keep an eye on that kickstarter as it as it comes out and then fulfills over the years because i know that i am a high tier backer and i assume teos is as well <laughs> Thank you out there to our listeners and our supporters. If you are a patron of the show, we very much appreciate it. And if you would like to become a patron of the show, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mastering DND. Uh, for our Master of Dungeon supporters, thank you. Master of the Realm supporters, you know you're in our show notes. And for our Masters of the Multiverse you are in our podcast, Keith Aman of The Monsters Know What They're Doing, Craig Bailey, Steve Bissonette, Eric, Merrick Blackman, Evil John, DM Chad, Darren Chandler, Seth Eckel, Andy Edmonds, The Mighty Jerd, Ben Heisler and Paige Lightman, Sean Hurst, Chad Jackson, Brian King, Jim Klingler, aka DM Prime Mover, Chad Lynch, The Matha Magician, Eric Mengi, The Micro Ant, Sean Molly, Falcon Neal, Post Fiction RPG Audio, Chance Russo at Drago Russo, Ross Sandberg, Andy Shotney, Krishna Simonse, Joe Tyler, James Walton, and Graham Ward. Thank you all for being supporters. Uh, you can also support us by leaving reviews on Apple Podcast, or you can subscribe to us via YouTube. Teos, where can people find you and your work? Uh, best place is to go to alphastream.org. From there, you can find everywhere I've been uh, doing things. Um, and Sean, if I'm hunting you down, where should I bring my weaponry and camouflage? You can bring it to either Twitter, Mastodon, or Blue Sky, or Facebook. Um, the show even has an account uh, on Blue Sky and on Twitter and on uh What's the other one there? Mastodon. Uh, so you can find us all over all the places. Yeah. So, everywhere. So, Teos, we are now in the realm of the Weird Wizard. What are we going to do now? Uh, I am for sure going to go explore that clockwork tower that Rob talked about. That sounds absolutely awesome. And I'm going to be on the lookout for orcs because they sound pretty nasty. 